Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Professional Service Group of Mercer County, and happy Aloha Friday. And uh, it is, uh, I guess it's getting into warm weather season because uh, I went to the Walmart the other day to do a little shopping, and they had Hawaiian shirts. And this is my brand new Hawaiian shirt from Walmart. So if you're interested, go to Walmart while they still have some inventory, and at least for $12.98, you can wear it once a week all summer, and you'll be um, participating in Aloha Friday. <clears throat> in addition to being Aloha Friday, today, very special day, is National Jelly Bean Day. And I've got my little bag of jelly beans here. So if you can't resist that handful of sweet jelly beans, you may want to go out and celebrate Jelly Bean, National Jelly Bean Day. So another auspicious holiday that we could celebrate together on this Friday. Um, welcome to the Professional Service Group of Mercer County. PSG of Mercer County is a group that is here for you. Anybody that is in any career transition or looking for career management, we have a lot of resources and information that we provide through a number of ways that help you become more efficient and more effective in your own job search. For instance, we do have our very own LinkedIn group. It is called PSG of Mercer County. It is not a hidden group. You can find it just by searching in the groups, but it is a little bit of a private group. By private, we mean if you are not yet a member of the group, just click the join button, but we will wait. You will wait to actually be admitted to the group until uh, we have the opportunity just to validate that you have indeed attended one of our meetings, either in person when we met before or now virtually. And so uh, please go to LinkedIn, join our LinkedIn group. The reason why we make it a private group, the reason why we kind of just pre-screen any member that uh, wants to join the group is we're just trying to keep people out that are just group collectors and name collectors and are really in it only for themselves. You know, they are probably people that are not much different that are, you know, making those spam phone calls and looking to get access to people. All of our members in our group, we have over 1,700 since we started the group probably eight, nine, 10 years ago. Uh, all those members have been to at least one of our meetings, whether in person or virtually. And so there's a good chance they really kind of get the meaning and importance of job search and the importance for job seekers. So there's a good chance that if when you're doing your own job search and you want to reach out to somebody, if they are someone in our LinkedIn group, there's a good chance they will reply to you because they understand the importance of helping other job seekers. So please join our LinkedIn group and as much as possible, uh, share and be active in the group as well. Your activity does help LinkedIn find you and promote you a little bit. Uh, when people are searching for someone like you with the keywords that they use, uh, the people that come up higher are people that are active on LinkedIn as opposed to people that are not as active on LinkedIn. So that's one of the contributing factors. In addition, we do have our website. Our website is psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org. It is more than a landing page. It is over 120 web pages of content. Uh, we have a menu across the top that gives you instant access to a lot of those pages. One of the pages is our resources page. And so if you're interested, or if you haven't seen that page before, uh, you may want to go ahead and take a look at it when you have a chance. We have links uh, via icons and links. We have links to 45 different resources for job seekers all on that page, and you'll just see the icons. There are uh, links to 16 other, excuse me, job seeker networking groups, similar to ours and others. We have 27 other career resources, which includes uh, coaches, state agencies, county agencies, and such. And our state agencies include um, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York, and of course, New Jersey. We even have a link to a personal wellness site. So if that's something that you want to take care of, look into, you know, it's a, a starting place for some people, as well as a link to a mental health website as well. So if you're a little stressed by job search and you need a little bit of help and guidance in that way, um, they may be able to help you as well. So go take a look. It could be a good starting place for you for some of these types of resources. And there's 45 all in one place on one web page, our resources page. So go take a look at that. So in just a moment, I will turn the meeting <clears throat> over to Madeline our presenter this morning, and she will share her screen. She's got a PowerPoint presentation. A little later today, we will post her slides. Thank you, Madeline, for sharing those with us. 
when you are just listening to the presentation and not have a need to actively participate, just keep your microphone on mute. Uh, we're getting into lawn care season, so you never know if a, a lawnmower or a leaf blower will be blowing past your window or if some of the trucks are out. So we just want to keep that accidental background noise from coming through. But when you have a question, uh, you will be able, to, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question of Madeline directly. We do use chat for our questions. And if you're not yet familiar with chat, chat is a little icon for most of you should be in the upper right corner of the screen. Kind of looks like that. I know it's a bad drawing. I'm an illustrator, not an artist. Nancy, I think could draw a better thing than I can. But on the upper right, that little circle with a tab, and when you click on that, you can actually write your question. And I'd say, ask you, please write the word question, type the word question. If you just type the word question, uh, then I will see that you have a question. I will uh, recognize you and you can unmute and ask your question of Madeline. If you pr prefer not to be unmuted, write the word question and followed by the text of your question and I will read it on your behalf. And I'll just ask us a little bit of a courtesy. Um, please write your question grammatically correct because I may not understand your question if you have your own abbreviations or shorthand or something and I don't want to misrepresent it at all. So if it means you have to type a few extra words, just ask that you do that because I want to get it right. If not, I'll just call on you and say, oh, can you please just ask your question? Just a win-win. And then when you can ask your question, you have the opportunity to send it to any one of us or to everyone. And I ask that you send it to everyone. So that way, myself and Madeline or anyone who's watching the chat, sometimes Bill and Alan watch it for us as well, we all get a chance to see it. If you just send it to one person, we may accidentally miss it. And we don't want to do that. So that's what I ask. So those are kind of our ground rules for today. And I think we are in good shape to move ourselves along. And I'm happy to say that PSG of Mercer County is very pleased to welcome Madeline Elmgren. After a successful career in corporate IT in various leadership roles, she established her own personalized career coaching practice, ME Coaching 365, to help others successfully navigate career challenges and work transitions. As an established career coach and outplacement specialist, Madeline provides a safe, comfortable environment where clients can discuss and explore career concerns, challenges, and goals. She helps individuals with a job search strategy, which includes career changes, resumes, cover letters, interview skills, and overall career management. Her empathy and genuine desire to help others bring a unique perspective to outplacement and coaching. She focuses on the individual needs of each client, ensuring everyone feels respected and valued as they address career challenges. PSG of Mercer County is very pleased to welcome the career coach, Madeline Elgren. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. So I'm going to share my presentation and we're going to you let me know if you see it or you have a problem with it. There it is, full screen developing a communication strategy. We see it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So um, even though you know I say end-to-end -end career coaching, as David said, you know, it's very important that we actually start at the beginning. And the value proposition is really important because everything else that you do, basically all of your communications, whether it's your elevator pitch, your resume, uh, your LinkedIn profile, everything actually comes from the value proposition. So that's why I think it's worth taking the time to actually explain it. And also I'm going to differentiate between what is the value proposition and the elevator pitch. So I actually do have a few slides on the elevator pitch after this, just to clarify it for you. And if anybody, like David said, anybody has questions throughout, please, you don't have to wait till the end, just, uh, you know, let me know. I'm not monitoring them though, so thank you, David, for uh, monitoring them for me. Okay, so starting off with, let's look at a definition of the value proposition versus the elevator pitch. Um, if you were to Google it, you'll probably see one of the definitions comes out as a clear story explaining how your skills solve an employer or customer problem in a unique or superior way. So the value proposition is actually a little more beefy, if you will, than your elevator pitch. And that means you can basically use it as your summary in your resume. You can use it as your marketing material. You can use it as your LinkedIn profile. Um, obviously, if it's in your resume, you wouldn't be doing it in first person, but you can actually put more in there that will let the person know. We'll, we'll cover the details on it. The elevator pitch, on the other hand, is a short one to two story sentence that summarizes or defines 
who you work with, right? Your target market and the general area in which you can help them. Now, I'll cover this a little bit more um, in detail later, but for those of you that are not familiar with the elevator pitch, basically that came from sales a very long time ago where they basically encountered somebody, let's say you're going to a meeting and you encounter somebody at the elevator and you're going up uh, in the elevator, what can you tell them if you want to just basically introduce yourself? Maybe you're trying to do a sales pitch. So in one to two sentences, how can you grab uh, your audience's attention? Okay, so it, they are different. But again, I just wanted to differentiate that and we'll actually cover a little bit more in depth on that later. Now, as far as your value proposition is concerned, obviously you want to state what is the value. Now, if you look at the three different screens that I have here, the three pictures, right? On the left, I have business, in the middle retail or hospitality, and then I have marketing. So depending on what the business is, that will determine your value proposition. Now you'll notice that there are quite a few that are run across all of them. So customer satisfaction at the bottom is you know, something that's the same on each one for obvious reasons, right? Everybody wants to make sure they have satisfied customers, uh, increasing clients, decreasing you know, spending, all of that is a common link. However, when you're looking at something like, let's say, marketing, for example, you need to make sure that your value proposition is mentioning things that are going to be key requirements of somebody in marketing. Media knowledge, that would be you know, huge. Communication, creativity. I mean, creativity obviously spans across different channels, but the goal from this slide is really to make you realize that your value proposition really needs to target what your end user customer right, or you know, your employer, depending on whether you're going to be an entrepreneur or not, uh, what they value the most. And those are the things that you need to make sure the key elements that your value proposition should include. Okay. And when we look at this one, this actually uh, is a little bit kind of like what I mentioned earlier on the very first slide. And we're talking about developing your communication strategy. Again, the importance of the value proposition is that everything else you're seeing here, right, your elevator pitch, your networking, marketing, everything actually stems from your value proposition. And I can tell you that a value proposition does take a while to develop, but not so much if you're not going the entrepreneurial route. So if you're looking to start your own business, right, whether it's, you know, coaching, you're starting a restaurant, or maybe you just want to be a consultant, um, those cases actually, especially if you're going to have a brick and mortar business, right, you have a pizza place, you know, some type of restaurant, uh, there are a lot more things that you need to take into account, um, but the value proposition still does take a bit of time to figure out, even if you are going to work as an employee for somebody, right? So the basic um, nuts, if you will, nuts and bolts of it is the same. It's just depending on what route you take, I might take a little bit longer. So why is the value proposition so important? Well, it's the ultimate reason why somebody should hire you. Right? It'll help differentiate you from your competition, and it serves as the basis for all of your job-related communication. And always remember, it is spoken, online, printed. And I know most people are thinking, well, everything is virtual, but it's not, right? And whenever you go, if you're, having a, if you're lucky enough to have an in-person interview, make sure you take a printed copy of your resume because you never know whether or not that person has even you know, had a chance to review it before they sit down with you. Right, so everything really that you see here does stem from the value proposition. Okay, so there are really four key elements, four pieces of information that are key to the value proposition. The first one is what you do. What skills is it that you bring to the table? This might seem a little bit obvious, but you really need to be very detailed on this. And I'm not referring to the soft skills, right? So it's great, especially if you're in customer service that you, know, you say you have great people skills. But these need to be skills that really are things that the client or the um, hiring manager is going to value. So what is it that you do? Maybe you're very analytical, right? Your analytical skills would be it. if you're in finance, um, anything that you do would be depending on the actual company that you're targeting, right? So the next one, who is your target employer or customer, right? Are your skills services aligned with a particular industry um, or company? So let's say you're worked in the pharmaceutical industry or you want to work in the pharmaceutical industry, try and be, try and narrow it down as much as possible. So pharmaceutical industry could be, well, you could be a scientist, you could be developing drugs, you could be in finance, you could be payroll, right? So you need to see what area and then make sure that what you're telling them that you're bringing to the table is actually something relevant for them, 
which brings me to the third item, what benefits you provide. Now, the key here is making sure that you see that the benefit is not the benefit you believe you bring, not the fact that you went to a very good school and that you had very good grades, but really the actual benefit that you would be employer or client perceives you're gonna bring. So for example, if let's say you happen to be in payroll and you know that they've been having problems getting payroll out on time, well, you need to make sure that you mention to them that you know, you're very successful in, in doing everything with payroll, you've never had a problem bringing, you know, getting it on time, and anything else that you can bring that actually shows them a benefit that they're gonna get from you. All your education is wonderful, all your experience is wonderful. However, what it boils down to is what you can do for them, which brings us now to the fourth item. What makes you distinctive, right? Why should they hire you instead of somebody else? Well, quite simply, this is where your um, actual stories come in, your storytelling. And while storytelling is something that is really more involved in the actual interview process, your value proposition should have specific details in them that say, hey, this is why you should hire me. And I am going to have some examples so that two examples, actually, so that you actually see what the value proposition looks like when it's constructed, including these four items. Now, some people would actually stop at the third, like what benefits you provide. You got one, two, three. That's great. However, if you're one of those individuals that keep finding yourself going up against others and you've done three, four interviews and then you lose at the very end, I mean, you're not selected. It could just be because you're not actually getting that exclusivity piece in there. You need to have a strong storytelling um, capabilities where you show them why they should pick you instead of somebody else. Any questions so far, David? Take that as a no. Um, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? I heard something, but I couldn't hear. Okay. All right, so we'll, so we'll move on. So this slide, um, this is actually one of my favorite slides. Uh, I, I did all the slides, but uh, I really like this one because this one actually uh, talks about, or really points to the way that our mind processes data right? The strength of your value proposition is measured in how you deliver the information that, you know, we've been discussing in these slides. So if you think of the pyramid as the way that the mind processes data, the very bottom piece, clarity, right? That refers to what we originally think when somebody tells us something, right? So if someone were to tell you something, the first thing the mind does is it tries to say, hmm, do I understand what this person is trying to tell me? Do I understand your offer? It is critical that you actually get this right, otherwise it will not go any further. So you need to make sure that you're clear in what you have to offer to your potential employer. Once you get past that, then you have credibility. So now the mind is saying, okay, I understand what you're telling me, I understand what you're selling or offering, but do I believe you can deliver? And you've got to make sure that you sell your credibility here because otherwise they're just, you know, going to put you off to the side. Now, if you have the bell of your clarity and your credibility correctly, then all of a sudden you're going to find yourself at the next level, the appeal. I want what you have to offer. Now, this is really important, even if let's say you approach somebody that perhaps does not have an open rec, uh, job requisition available. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I have seen it where individuals have actually been made offers after reaching out to somebody at a company that they knew was kind of having problems in certain areas and positioning themselves with a great value proposition, showing to them what they can do and what they can fix. So all of a sudden, the person is looking at it as, well, you know what, you're right. Um, I understand what you said. I believe you can deliver on this. And I think I'm going to, you know, I, I definitely want to do this. And I have seen positions opened because of that. Um, now, once you're at this point, though, what you need to make sure you do is, again, the exclusivity piece. I can't find it anywhere else. You have to show them why they should hire you versus somebody else. Now, this might be a little bit tricky for some individuals, but I guarantee you it's worth the time uh, to just, you know, really sit down and figure it out because that's what's going to make the difference between you getting hired or somebody else. Now, there was uh, one person that uh, it's a friend of mine that actually was in the printing. She's in the printing industry. And it's funny because she's been there forever and she's looking to move to somewhere else. But she was thinking that, well, you know, I do have a lot of current knowledge, but then I do have a lot of older knowledge. Maybe people won't want to hire me. Well, guess what? 
the fact that she has been in the industry for so long and people are thinking, well, nobody prints again, everything's digital. Her background is very unique and it's very, she has a niche market where there's companies that are looking for a background that recent graduates don't have because everything seems to be digital. So in her case, if she targets the appropriate market and she shows them that she, I can, you know, figure out what type of paper you had. I can tell you what marketing uh, materials will work better because people are still doing things on paper. That in itself is something that she can position herself with where it will make her more exclusive than the other person that maybe, you know, yes, you will pay them less or recent graduates, but they have no idea because again, they haven't grown up in the age where printers and a lot of uh, paper and that kind of marketing is around. So you just have to find that one area that really makes you um, more exclusive than the next guy. And you have it. And if you think you don't, keep searching because it's there. Okay. So now the value proposition, as I said before, it is, you know, something that could take a while. It is a multi-step process, right? So you start off by looking at what it is you offer, what you do. You'd have to actually look at your skills and your experiences. And my recommendation is don't just think of it in your head. Write it on paper, you know, type it up, Word, whatever. Whatever way is easiest, but just really look at it, especially if you're looking to venture out on your own business, right? What is it that you want to offer? What are the services? You need to do your homework as far as your competition. What can you bring uh, to the table? And again, if you're doing something where you need a brick and mortar, meaning you're you know, going to actually have a building or somewhere that you're actually you know, opening a shop to people, there's a little bit more involved. Your target audience, your employers, right? Your customers, who are your clients? And you really, really need to look at this um, and all these steps, you have to go through them multiple times. The benefits, right? Again, perceived by your employer. If you're not sure, and this is again, if you're looking at, you know, potentially starting your own business, you got to make sure that you ask individuals, right? Take your own poll, like just ask them, right? Um, as far as you're being an independent person looking to be employed by someone, do your research. And it's funny because I remember um, in the last, last time we had a presentation, I think it was a coach panel, somebody asked, well, what are the three things you should always do, you know, when preparing for an interview? And I said, homework, 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 because that's so key to everything. You need to do your homework on the role, on the company, and the industry. It's not just about your background. You need to understand who your target audience is and be prepared. Otherwise, they're going to think that A, you don't care, or really you're not qualified, right? But really more, you know, the latter, um, the former, that you really didn't care because you didn't do your homework, okay? The benefits, this goes again, if you do your homework, you're going to see what that customer, that employer sees as a benefit to them, not to you, to them. And then the differentiator, what sets you apart. It's all about your storytelling. It's all about being prepared, okay? So this is one example that we're gonna use here. This example is about a tax operations executive, right? He's currently employed. So this is what the value proposition for him could be. This is what it would look like. And then we're gonna look at whether or not it actually meets, ticks off all of the four different things we covered. So I lead a tax and transfer pricing operations for medical device clients in global markets. I have in-depth understanding of domestic and foreign tax and transfer pricing. I'm accountable for accuracy of US, federal, state, and foreign audits. My contributions to ongoing tax planning have resulted in active lowering overall tax expenses. So looking at this, kind of wonder how many of you guys think that it actually kind of takes off everything. Well, I'll tell you very quickly. When you look at it this way, what is it that you do? That was the first one. It's in blue. I lead tax and transfer pricing operations. Very simple. There it is. Who is your target employer or customer? What's in green? For medical device clients in global markets. What benefit do you offer? Okay, that's the purple. I have in-depth understanding of domestic and foreign tax and transfer pricing. I'm accountable for accuracy of U.S. federal, state, and foreign audits. There it is. And then the last one. What makes you distinctive? My contributions to ongoing tax planning have resulted in actively lowering all expenses. So here, you're not just telling them what you do and who your target audience is, right? 
but the benefit that you bring, and then really what makes you distinctive. If you didn't put in there that your contributions have resulted in actively lowering overall tax expenses, they might not really see why they should bring you in versus somebody else, okay? And by the way, this there's no names around this, but this is a real one that was used, and yes, the person did get hired. Um, so again, it's beefy, so I would not use this as an elevator pitch because it is a mouthful. However, for other things, your summary, you know, don't use it again in first person, but you can use, use it as your summary in, in uh, your resume. You can use it cover letters. Cover letters, by the way, are very important. Anybody that tells you that they're not, well, the majority of the individuals actually will read it and it's worth your time because even if somebody doesn't read it, when it comes down to it, if at the very end you're looking at competing with somebody else and you take the time to do a cover letter, you take the time to send a thank you note afterwards, uh, that's going to actually make you stand out. So always take the time and always personalize them. So I just had to get that in there. I'm a big proponent of those. Okay, so this next uh, slide shows us a marketing person, business development, and they're in transition, meaning they're uh, waiting to move to a different position. Okay, this person was unemployed. So this is what their value proposition may look like. I lead marketing teams in development and execution of strategic brand partnerships for sports products on a global level, individual project management, and ensuring deliverables from concept to completion by delivering accessibility, innovation, customization, and brand status that establish multiple strong brands globally. So that sounds like it has everything, right? And it does. So what is it you do? Again, you see right there in the blue, lead marketing teams in development execution of strategic brand partnerships. So for marketing, business development, this is telling them exactly what they're looking for. Who's the target employer customer? Sports products on a global level. If you happen to work in any field and you work in a global market, make sure you include that in your value proposition and everything that stems from it, okay? Because that's key. And if there is also an applicant tracking system, an ATS, um, making sure that you have the word global in there definitely will help you not hurt. Benefits do you offer? Again, project management, ensuring deliverables from concept to completion, and of course, what makes you distinctive. And you have in there words like delivering accessibility, innovation, customization, brand status, and establishing multiple strong brands globally. Now, in your case, um, you could include the brands. Uh, chances are, if you're marketing, that there's no problem if you name them, but it's something that you could definitely include. And these are very specific to marketing, um, but again, you could just put whatever you want in there, but it has to be personalized. If you try and copy somebody else's value proposition, um, and it's not like in your field, it's not gonna work. So just use this as a guide, as opposed to you know copying it verbatim. Oh, excuse me, Madeline. Sure. So there's, there's a question from Nancy. Should they include dollar amounts that they lowered tax expenses by, you know, something like that? Yes, uh, you can definitely include that. What I would say is be careful not to mention company names if that could be a problem for the company. So you would know, um, obviously, if you're doing something that was proprietary, um, you don't want to say, oh, I work for, you know, Acme and I reduced their you know, their lawsuit expenses by this amount, right? Um, of course, I'm just being facetious there, but yes, you definitely can include that. And on your resume, that would be part of your accomplishments. On a resume, you gotta make sure that you put in dollar values. Anything that's quantifiable would be great. Um, but just on the resume, remember, you tell them what you accomplished, but not how. They need to bring you in in order for you to be able to do that. Any other questions? No other questions that are posted. Remember folks, you can post your questions in chat or just type the word question, which is the digital equivalent of raising your hand and you'll be called on. If you want to get your okay. questions answered. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And now here I have two links, which I highly recommend that you look into. Um, they are a little bit outdated, but I included them because I think they're really very good uh, videos. So the first one is Dr. Flynn McLaughlin from, Man Man he's the managing director of Mech Labs. And essentially what he has is a research company. It's out of Florida. And what they do is they gather tons of information on the internet, right? It's a research company. And he has a lot of different videos on the value proposition. And actually the four um, areas that I said you need to focus on actually come from what they 
basically preach, right? And I say, if you see the video, you'll know why I say preach. The first one is actually 90 minutes. It's a presentation he did, I think it was in 2016 um, at Harvard. Uh, it is 90 minutes, but I thought it really was a very good, very powerful presentation. That's why I wanted to include it. The second link shows Joe Wilson, Senior Education Strategist at Mars, and he also covers the value proposition strategy and the way to go about it. Now, the only thing that I did not like with Joe's is that he only had the three items. He did not have the exclusivity piece, which I think is really important, but I do like his presentation a lot. It's very powerful as well, which is why I included it. So if you can, you know, do if you have the time to sit through the 90 minutes, I highly recommend it. Um, I myself actually went through these when I started my practice um, several years ago because it really, I find it does help to just kind of step back. And I, I did pay somebody to help me with this uh, because it's a lot easier and quicker uh, if you actually have somebody kind of point you through it. So these are things that I sat through and I, I, yeah, I think it's very powerful. Um, the next slide though shows you uh, one that is still Mech Labs, but not as long. So this one is actually one that is very recent. And according to what I looked on the website, what I saw, Meg Labs is now providing free courses for people that are looking to get into marketing, kind of showing them what is it that you should be saying from a marketing perspective. So if you want to start your own marketing company or you're working for somebody, um, this is one that you know I recommend you go out there, see if there's anything that you're interested in. And again, the, what I saw, they all appear to be free. So the price is right. Um, and it's just, again, value proposition development. I always find, even though you're going to have the slides, I always think it's good to have resources that you can go to because, you know, we hear a lot everywhere from different people. And sometimes, you know, we forget and maybe, you know, whether you are listening to this now with me or you look at it, you know, later, you might forget. So I think having the resources to actually go and get other information is always good. Okay, now, unless somebody had another question, I'll go right into the um, elevator pitch. There are no other questions right now, but okay. if anyone's got a question while we're still at or just ending the topic of value proposition, now is a good time. So you're welcome if you want to type it in or just quickly unmute yourself and you can ask away. Okay. And I'll play some Jeopardy music while we wait to see if anyone types <laughs> It's funny. Okay, so and we can ask questions later. That's fine as well. Yep, so your, ele you. your elevator pitch. Um, that one, as I said earlier, it really comes from the sales times where people were, you know, the sales guy was just running into someone and said, gee, I want to sell them this, right? I want to sell them my product. I want them interested in our services. Oh. You know, what is it I can tell them in the couple of minutes that I'm going up the elevator or that run into them in the hallway? But it really has expanded well beyond that to really just something that you could say to someone, even when we meet at PSG in person, right? We used to do that 30 second where you go around at the very end and everybody introduces themselves. That's an elevator pitch of sorts as well, right? Because it actually tells somebody what you do, what industry you're in, right? So your elevator pitch, if you actually Google, um, not in the dictionary, but if you Google it, it'll probably come back and tell you that it's a condensed version of your value proposition, or uh, actually it tells you number two, a succinct and persuasive sales pitch, right? So it's a short speech that explains what you do and why you're unique. So again, it sounds like your value proposition, but it is a lot more condensed. Um, for the reason that, you know, if you're thinking about it, if you're just kind of meeting somebody in the street, you don't have a time to really give them that three, four sentences that your value proposition will provide. Um, but again, it's very something that you do need to rehearse. It needs to come out naturally. Even though you're rehearsing it, my recommendation is don't feel that you have to say it verbatim because that way, if it sounds rehearsed, it's not going to come out naturally. Not to mention the fact that you could be telling somebody, oh, this is what I do. And then they ask a question and then you kind of lose track of where you were, right? So practice it, rehearse it, but make sure that it comes naturally. And if the words you're using are not something that you're comfortable with, then you have to redo it. You have to be comfortable with what you're saying because you're representing yourself, right? You have to sound credible. Okay, so your elevator pitch solves a problem or answers a question. In short, concise to the point, we just said that, describes what makes you unique, leaves your audience wanting to know more about your business. And again, it's tailored to your audience. So you are seeing certain things being repeated here, like the 
value proposition. But again, it's going to be a lot more concise. And by the way, um, maybe this is something you guys can be thinking about. When we go back to in-person at PSG in Princeton, think about what you would say as your elevator pitch. Remember, it's only, I think we're down to 30 seconds, so it is short, but think about it. Uh, you're not asking for a job, you're saying what you do and for what audience. So practice it and maybe we can hear it next time we're in person. Okay, so your elevator pitch would not have technical or industry jargon, be long-winded speeches or stories, a strict script, you want to sound credible, all right? So again, this is the one that I said, yes, it's a script, you have to memorize it, but at the same time, it has to flow. You can't just think that you have, have to say it verbatim, right? And as far as the industry jargon, the reason for that is that you don't know if the person that you're talking to is gonna actually A, understand it, or B, uh, be associated or familiar with those particular terms. So in other words, if you're in technology, right? You don't want to be using things like um, you want to say, yes, I work in the cloud. That's fine. But you don't want to be specific um, and start using words that are just specific to, let's say, uh, Microsoft or IBM or, you know, HP or whatever. Right. You want to make sure that you use the generic terms that will go across no matter where the person is working. So now we're going to look at a couple of examples. And again, this is just for the elevator pitch, right? So the same tax operations executive currently employed, and all we would say is, I lead tax and transfer pricing operations for medical device clients in global markets. I have in-depth understanding of domestic and foreign tax and transfer pricing. So again, you're not saying the very details. Remember the last one we had, it was like four sentences, but you're telling them what you do and what your background is. Right, so it doesn't, they don't have to know that it happens to be in pharmaceutical or in medical devices, but it actually tells them what you do. And this, by the way, is great because as I always tell people, you should cast your net wide, unless you have very, very specific um, requirement that you work for a pharmaceutical or you work for automotive, cast your net wide. You never know, people have transferable skills. So what is one industry can very well transfer into another. So your elevator pitch is perfect not to just, you know, put something in there, if, unless the person you're talking to is in the pharmaceutical industry, obviously. Okay. So the next one, right, we looked at the guy who's in marketing, business development, and transition. All you have to say is, I lead marketing teams in development and execution of strategic brand partnerships for sports products on a global level, including project management, ensuring deliverables from concept to com completion. So again, you're not going into the nitty gritty of what you know your outcome is, right? But again, this positions you very quickly as a person that develops uh, team leader, if you can read into this, right? Including project management, ensuring deliverables. So somebody who is accountable, very simple, one sentence, again, making it shorter. Any questions now? I love questions, so I'm kind of disappointed we don't have too many questions, but that's okay. <laughs> yep, no worries at all. People are listening to uh, what you're offering us, and uh, but but folks, hey, here's a here's an opportunity to delve in a little bit deeper. Please feel free to ask away. Madeline is a coach; she's got a lot of experience with this, and can be very helpful to you. So, yeah, ask away if you'd like. Either type them in the chat, or at this point, I guess you can even just unmute and introduce yourself. Okay. Well, I think we're going to end up with a very, uh, a very long, uh, open-ended discussion afterwards, and <laughs> because that, that was actually my last slide. Um, okay. This is actually, this is my last slide, um, and I think this is. I'm going to quote Pooh because I think this is actually very uh, unmarked with individuals that are in transition. If ever there's a tomorrow or we're not together, there's something you must always remember: you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Seriously, folks, even if you're not working, there's a job out there for you. Do not let a bad experience somewhere or some hiring manager that doesn't know how to interview and made some comments that made you feel bad. Don't let that deter you. There are roles out there for you. So keep at it and remember, homework, homework, homework. Thank you. Wilma has, I guess, a concern or an observation for herself. She said, I'm concerned that my pitch might be too detailed or not specific to the prospect. 
So um, maybe you could discuss that with her, or Wilma, you could even give your pitch and we can evaluate it together if you don't mind. And unmute yourself. I see you nodding your head there. I'm not, I'm not hearing you. Um, can you get a little closer to your microphone, maybe? I hope I put that out as an open question. Sometimes I think it's going to be that last piece uh, I can't talk. Um, so we, I don't, I, we didn't hear a lot, a lot of what you're saying. It sounds like maybe you have a bad internet or Wi-Fi connection, but it sounds like you were addressing this more as a more open question than specific. Okay, I'll, I'll write it. We need to now, yeah, yeah, if you want to, yeah, I guess, type that into chat as well. But yeah, I'm thinking you have maybe a, a bad Wi Fi connection. Or, have, bad... or, you know, what I like to use is I use flashcards. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're willing to do that as well. But yeah, if you can write that, yes. uh, we'll address it right then. But um, yeah, I, I guess, Madeline, if you just want to speak a bit more broadly then about. How do you make sure that your elevator pitch, or I guess even your value proposition, depending on the audience, That's what I just wrote. yeah, is not too detailed, or or um, make sure that it is not specific. Great. Right. Not how great. much how much detail should it include? Right. right. Well, um, okay. I just did. I just did. Yeah, that's what she wrote. Also, we need to figure out how much detail really sells me. All right, and you know what, and that really. Um, I hate to say this, but it depends. Um, I would say for the majority of us, uh, you don't need to get too much into detail because it is an elevator pitch. I'm assuming you did say for the elevator pitch, right? So you need to understand yeah, who you are delivering this to, right? So if you know that, let's say you're meeting um, a VP in marketing and you're going for a marketing role, you need to really know what it is that they're looking for, what industry it is, right? What are the different uh, facets in marketing? If you're not in marketing and you're meeting with this person, you have a lot of homework to do, right? But if you are in marketing, let's say, um, then you should be able to basically just explain to them what your background is, uh, what you're looking to do, what you enjoy doing. Not asking them for a role, but if you do your homework and you know specifically what areas they're hiring in, State your background in a manner that shows them that you have the qualifications to fit in and hit the ground running. This is kind of like what I tell people when you're looking at doing a cover letter. The best way to really do a cover letter is when you look at the company that you're going to be applying for, look at their mission statement, look at what it is that you know they're interested in. If it's a company that believes in going green, right, they're very much conscious about the environment, make sure that when you explain to them why you want to you know, work in marketing and how, let's say, you're looking to have a position where it allows you to be creative and really help people help the environment, right? So in other words, put something in there that's very specific to the person that you're meeting, right? Now, again, this is your value proposition and your elevator pitch should be generic, but if you know the person you're meeting, research on the company and see if you could put something in there so that they know, not just that, hey, I'm qualified to do this, I've you know, developed, um, I've developed, let's see, different products. I've actually gone to market and, you know, let's say you work in Cheerio, you worked in help doing the Cheerio boxes, right? Or whatever. Um, just make sure that you include something about the company that shows them. I recently had a client that she, uh, she got this job and she came back to me and she said, you know what, anybody that you refer to this company, you got to make sure to tell them when they interview, they have to look at or even before the interview, they have to look at what the company stands for and what they believe in. This company is very much about work-life balances and about that everybody was healthcare. Everybody should be allowed to have healthcare. So you need to include something in there about, you know, being passionate about being able to get somebody uh, working for a company that's going to enable you to make a difference in society. At the end of the day, you don't want it just a job. You want to make a difference. So in other words, put a little personal touch and one that relates to the company. If you know who you're going for, what company you're, you know, 
interviewing with. Again, your value proposition is generic, but if you know who you're meeting with, you should definitely include that. Make okay. sense? Wilma? Hopefully that yeah. was helpful. Um, yeah. And, and you know what? You can also email me. Um, actually, yeah. I don't know. I have them I'm happy to review that with you offline as well if you like. <clears throat> yes, and I will be posting Madeline's contact information in just a moment in chat so that we all have it. And of course, chat will be um, available for you to download um, well right now if you'd like, or it will be on our website as well. And I, I know for myself, I've always been a fan of keeping the elevator pitch as short and sweet as possible. Yes. And if you're worried that you have too much detail, then you have too much detail. So, you know, I'd say do that. Now, if you then get a conversation with someone who was interested and attracted to you from your elevator pitch, you could talk about a lot more detail. So. Right, if you overdo it, like if you try and do the value proposition in place of an elevator pitch or go into that level of detail about their company when they don't even know you, right? Uh, that might kind of scare them away or they might tune out. So just pique their interest. Uh, and then do your homework on it. And some of you may remember when we were meeting in person, we don't do elevator pitches or introductions now virtually, uh, but Madeline, we did not, we haven't done 30 second introductions for years. We've done what we called five second introductions. Oh, Hello, okay. my name is, this is what I do. And now it was a couple of reasons. One was our group was quite big. And so if we had, you know, 70 or 80 people doing 30 seconds to a minute, um, you know, we would have to pay rent to the library, you know, <laughs> just be there too long. Um, the other is think about the networking meeting situation. You're in a room with 30, 40, 50 people. They're all going to do their 30 plus second elevator pitch. After the third or fourth one, you just zone out. Just so, so, you know, I, I think it's important that you craft it short and sweet. The value proposition be, where Madeline talked about it could be part of your summary or your, maybe even your LinkedIn profile. Um, you have a little bit more leeway and it could be, you know, more in the way she's crafted that. Kathy has a question. If you're in, in a new industry and you recommend trying your value proposition, let's see, would you recommend trying your value proposition out on someone in that industry and specifically ask for feedback? Is that usually a good use of your contact? That depends on the relationship with that person. Um, if the person happens to be a mentor, uh, that's that's fine. Uh, if the person happens to be your manager, new manager who's not a mentor, I would probably say um, try you know somebody else. Uh, but if you are new in the industry, I would say you know get your feet wet a little bit, learn more about the industry, right? So that you you know what they value more, um, and then. See if you can find a mentor, but definitely try it out on somebody else. Um, but again, you have to tread lightly. It's a new industry. You were just hired. You have to make sure that you approach the right person. Otherwise, they might be think, kind of questioning whether or not you know, they hired the right person. right? But if you have somebody that you trust, um, by all means, practice makes perfect. Definitely have somebody else and something else. Also, say it out loud. Say it out loud to yourself. You could practice it in the mirror. Just you know, just like anything else, presentations, interview skills, I always tell people not only just look at the questions and practice them, but practice them in front of a mirror. Practice your timing because they don't have that much time. Your answers should not be uh, more than a couple of minutes long, right, when they ask you a question. So practice that as well. You know, Madeline, I'm wondering, certainly, you know, I agree, you know, making it with someone you trust because you need that feedback. But someone that you trust might be a spouse or a partner, um, you know, a, a close best friend. Would they be good people? No, <laughs> probably not. I probably said that too quickly, right? Um, it really depends if they happen to be in the industry that you're working. Um, usually mom and dad, your children, your spouse are probably not the best people because A, they usually don't know necessarily uh, what you do, don't know your industry. Or B, they, you know, might actually, you know, be afraid to hurt your feelings. Oh, yeah, it's great. You sounded wonderful, right? Or it could be the other way around. I'm referring to somebody like anybody right here that would be, you know, on PSG on the panel, somebody that is more familiar with the different industries that can give you that feedback without 
being overly critical, but being honest. So I would say, yes, definitely ask somebody, but don't rely on just your closest of, you know, family, friends, spouses, you know, children. Um, you need to ask somebody that is an unbiased person and that's going to be your best bet. But if you can get a mentor when you're, and it doesn't have to be in the same company. Um, and people, by the way, if you reach out to somebody on LinkedIn, um, like let's say if you reach out to me and you said, hey, I'm in this new area, do you have somebody that you can recommend? I've actually done this for clients where I've connected them with individuals um, that are in the industry they're looking to get into to have that discussion because there's nothing like talking to somebody who's already in the industry to get the real description of what they can expect. Um, and they're flattered by it because they're trying to help the next generation. Um, but definitely stay away from, you know, the, the feedback from the families, from how do you sound, that's fine, but the context of it, that you really should ask somebody else. I thought it was cute that among the people you suggest not to include were your children. And I'm thinking, if you do ask your children for your feedback, don't do it at allowance time. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you exactly. just make it a completely false positive. Right. Um, our good friend Alex has asked if he can make a comment. So certainly, Alex, uh, now's your opportunity. Okay, so the elevator pitch has three parts to it from my perspective. One is less important and two are very important. And you'll be surprised what I'm going to say about which one is less important. It's a content. Let me tell you what I think is important. First, the visual part. When you walk in front of the room and everybody's looking at you, before you open your mouth, people already make an opinion about you and they judge you. That is very important. The second thing is, let's ask ourselves, what is the purpose of the elevator pitch? The elevator pitch is not for the purpose of making you feel good that you have 65 people listening to you for 30 seconds. That's not the objective. The objective of the elevator pitch is, and this is really the test, will people follow up with you after the meeting? The elevator pitch is an opportunity to establish relationship with some people that you know or possibly knew new people. Uh, it has to be short. It has to be something that it's easy for you to remember. It's easy for you to deliver. Allow me to give you my elevator pitch and I'm open for critique. Hello, I'm Alex Freund. I'm a career coach. I help people in transition and make them feel comfortable during the interview process. I'm Alex Freund. I want some pushback. I want some feedback. I want people to critique me, what they liked about it and what they didn't like about it. Everybody's shutting off their mics. I think everybody <laughs> is afraid to say something. I, Alex, honestly, um, I, think it, I think it's good. You're basically letting us know that you are an interview coach. Um, the target, individuals in transition, very importantly, you make them feel comfortable. Um, so I like that because individuals that are in transition, it's almost like a fear factor um, going to interviews. It's just a very scary thing for individuals. Um, and it was very succinct. So I'm basically, happy. Basically, I put the hook out there and I say, if you have problems with interviewing and you fear, you may want to talk with me. I may, may be able to help you take the fear out of the process. If you're not interviewing, you don't come to me after the meeting to talk with me. That's it. Now I could have stand, I could no, I could have stood in front of the people and tell the world how wonderful I am. Who wants to hear that? I'm one of 67 people sitting in the in the conference room, and I'm let's say number 63. Who wants to hear the person after so many? After a while, you, you almost you almost block your hearing because after 10 people, you, you, are, you can't absorb more information. Yes. You're great. There's, yeah, a, Alex. there's a difference between doing it in front of a big audience as opposed to just doing it like to an individual or, or you know, in an elevator itself. So I agree with you. 
I think it's important in both situations that you have to be succinct because people's attention span these days aren't that long. You were to the point, I think you did have the hook and you, you presented the value that you bring to it. And the thing that I like that you did also, which we don't talk about a lot, and maybe, you know, since we haven't been in person, but the fact that you mentioned your name again at the end, I think that was important because people, you know, at, at the end of your presentation might not even remember your name. And so I think doing that the second time was really valuable as well too. And you know, what becomes important with those quick elevator pitches that just grab someone's attention with that one sentence, if you're in a group and it's 30, 40 people, they're gonna think, Alex is the person I wanna to talk to in this group. So afterwards, you may have that meeting where you can go into more detail and Alex can talk about his process if that was what was important. Or um, you can learn more about the person who gives that quick introduction among all the others that you're hearing. So even if you're a little overwhelmed by a, a large group, uh, by having the short elevator pitch, by just grabbing a couple of people's attention, you'll be able to have those conversations with those few important people that you can meet in that meeting. Yeah, I remember, David, when we did the five-second elevator pitch, and mine was, hi, I'm Alex Freund. I'm an interview coach. I take the fear out of interview process. I'm Alex Freund. Yep. I don't know if it was more than five seconds what I said, but I essentially <laughs> the essence of the essence. Yeah, and even though we called it five seconds and we had fun with people who were really going on and on, seven, eight, nine seconds really didn't matter. It was really to get people to, to focus in a way that you and Madeline are talking about. Yep. Now, let, let me make another mention. If you have to make an elevator pitch, be prepared. Don't just walk in front of the people and then start thinking, okay, I don't know what I'm going to say. That's a prescription for failure. Right. You don't get a second chance to make a first opinion. You're, you're making every word count. So it, it's harder to just talk with less words than it is to go on and on. So you, you do need to practice in order to be able to get every word to be valuable and important. Alan, not only to practice, but to, to gain the confidence to stand in front of a large group of people, look at them, smile, and say what you have to say. That is difficult. That is difficult. We are not, it's not customary for us to stand in front of 60 people and everybody looking at you. And basically, you're an actor on stage. How many of us are, from, are, are comfortable being an actor on stage? And that's what you are. So you can see the fear on people's face. They don't know what to say. And we are rambling is when you don't know when to stop. You can just keep going and going and going. And very often I found people are just rambling. That's a fear that pushes them on and on. And you know, Alex, and for everybody, almost everyone who has to be quote unquote on stage, or even if you're standing alone to 20 seconds or 30 seconds for an elevator pitch, almost everyone is nervous. It's like Alex said, it's not a natural situation for a lot of people. And even the most accomplished stage actors will tell you that they get into an intense stage fright until they walk on stage and, and say their first line. And these are people that do this for a living. So it's really very natural. And so realize that if you're feeling a little nervous, the person who was before you was nervous. The person who's coming after you is nervous. You're not the only one, and and don't let that overwhelm you. Uh, you know, you you know what you have to say. You know your message, and let people know. Introduce yourself. And a little nervousness just means you care for the most part. So if you didn't care, you'd probably go in and you know say whatever, and you know maybe sound credible, maybe not. But it's the fact that you care that makes you a little nervous. Some butterflies are okay, so don't let that deter yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, and you know, you know, take a deep breath, or uh, you know, envision how good this is going to go just before you step up to introduce yourself. Yeah. Let me also add the pra practical side of the elevator pitch. Assume there are thirty people in the room and you are number ten. So for the first nine ones, while they talk, you recite in your own head what will you say when 
your turn comes up. Once Correct. after you said yours, we see you. Yeah. You you turn it off and you don't hear anything else. Right. Am I saying the truth? Um, you don't have to disagree with me, but um, I've seen it at my on my own uh, doing this occasion. I have to admit. Yep, absolutely. Any other questions, folks, that you have for Madeline about? Yes. Um, okay. I'd like to jump into into the fire <laughs> using a, an example of a elevator pitch. Hi, my name is Rock. I have extensive experience assessing financial statements and using corporate logic to make a win-win for the company and our customers. Thank you. This is the elevator pitch or was this the, yeah, the elevator pitch, not the value, right? But not the exactly, value. the former, the okay. former. Do me a favor, can you repeat it again? Yes. Hi, my name is Rock. I have extensive experience assessing financial statements and using corporate logic to make a win-win for the company and our customers. Thank you. It's, it's good. Um, what is the kind of role you're pursuing though? Senior financial analyst, finance. Okay. okay. Yeah, I got the finance. I was just trying to figure out because, you know, finance is very big. So I was wondering, are yes. you a financial analyst? Are you, okay. Yes, yes. It's it's good. Um, I would probably want to include the word um, analyst in there or analyzing. I, okay. I don't think you included that, but it's good. It's good for an elevator pitch. Um, I think it needs to be tweaked a little bit more though, but it's, it's good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Madeline, may I add a comment here? Yes, please. Rock, um, why do you think I want to talk with you after your elevator pitch? What did you I say? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what did you communicate with me that said, oh my God, I need to talk with Rock after the meeting? You basically said what you think you are doing. Well, that's not necessarily what I may be needing. If I do need somebody like you, it's likely I may want to follow up with you. But if not, you know, you need to put a hook there. Some, something interesting. Uh, uh, how many of you remember, um, <laughs> no, I don't remember him. Uh, Barry, David, help me. Bar yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, yeah. He Barry Seltzer. Yeah, he, Seltzer. Yeah, Barry yeah, Seltzer. I remember him. I remember his elevator pitch. Go ahead. Bar Barry Seltzer. Uh, he was my client, and we worked on this. And um, uh, one here, here was his final version. Hi, I'm Barry Seltzer. I saved the woman's life. I worked on Epic, which is an app or software. And then he sat down. He said the moment he put that out there, everybody was interested talking with him after the meeting. Oh, you saved the woman's life. Tell me what you did. So this leads into a conversation. Remember, the only objective of the elevator pitch is to continue talking to people, develop relationships. It is not for you to say to the world, I'm wonderful, because nobody's really interested in that. So again, uh, Barry put the hook there. And he told me it's successful after the meeting. People always come to him and they want to chat with him. Rock, I would say also having your name Rock could be something that's catchy, like something with solid as a rock. So it's something that people are going to remember <laughs> right away. So that, that might Absolutely. be helpful as well. <laughs> Thank you. Don't let the one-liner upstage you. <laughs> so, so folks, we'll certainly keep the session open for open networking in just a few minutes. 
uh, and we'll turn the recording off when we do open networking. We're kind of getting a little bit into that, but I'm glad we were able to use Rock's example as a way of crafting in the beginning process of crafting an elevator pit. So Rock, thank you for sharing that. Any other questions for Madeline while we're still uh, have that opportunity? And if not, we will um, move on. But anything else, folks, that are on your mind? Going once. Going twice. Oh, now the pressure is on. People are wondering if they should speak or not. I'm staying on anyway, but that's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, and as we've been and as we've been able to do for the virtual meetings here, um, we will keep the session open even when we in a moment officially quote unquote end the meeting, just as if we were hanging around the library meeting room and we were just chit-chatting among ourselves and catching up. And we could talk about anything we want. And for, uh, for any of the coaches that are on the still on the call, and we have a few that are here, you can ask them as well at that time as well. Um, but at the very least, I want to say to Marilyn, thank you so much for uh, presenting uh, this topic. I've always thought that this is very important, and I'm glad that you've been able to do it. And it was really special that you were able to not only show elevator pitch and value proposition, both very important, but you contrasted in how one is used in a slightly different place in a different way than the other. So I found that very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for Marilyn. having me. Madeline has presented a few times with us before on a panel, and I'm glad you were able to do this specific targeted topic for us this week, so thank you. I uh, want to let you know uh, who's visiting and what's coming up in terms of topic over the coming weeks. Uh, it seems to be we're in a uh, coaching uh, group right now. So next week, uh, Coach Lynn Franklin will be here interviewing from a position of power. So we'll be having an interviewing discussion and how you take charge of the interview and uh, be able to present your information in a strong way. So Lynn Franklin will be here. She's new to our group. I'm so glad she's able to join us. That's April 29th. And the following week, May 6th, Coach Terry Seaman, Terrence Seaman will be here. Well-being for job seekers. And so, you know, conducting a job search can take a toll sometimes, physically or mentally. And so uh, Terry will be talking to us about the well-being, mm -hmm. uh, taking care of ourselves during the job search process. So that's what's coming up over the next two weeks. Now, you can always look at our website, psgofmercycounty.org. Right at the top in the menu, we have an events calendar page. And our, web, our website shows in the events meetings through um, June or July. So we've got quite a few. So you can always see a topic that's coming up, a presenter that's coming up. Uh, that way, if there's a meeting on a topic and a presenter you don't want to miss, you can put them right on your own event calendar and make sure you show up on that Friday morning. Um, other groups that are meeting in the coming weeks, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey will be meeting in a few weeks. They meet always on the second Saturday morning of the month, so May 14th will be that meeting. Uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, Saturday, May 14th at 8 o'clock. Coach John Hadley will be presenting Turn Interviews into Offers. So go to thebreakfastclubnj.com, thebreakfastclubnj.com. And our good cousin organizations, uh, PSG of Central New Jersey meets on Mondays at 10.30 in the morning. Show up a little bit early. They're also virtual. PSGCNJ.biz, PSGCNJ.biz. And PSG of Morris County meets on Wednesdays at 9.30 in the morning. They open up their sessions much earlier, so you can go to psgmc.org, psgmc.org, and join their session as well on Wednesday mornings uh, as uh, between 8.30 and 9.30. So that's what's coming up uh, with both us and around the community and uh, over the next week or so. So once again, thank you so much to Madeline. So glad you were able to join us. As always, thank you for being a continued supporter of PSG of Mercer County. And um, until we get to see you very soon, hopefully virtually, if not in person, uh, until that time comes, I'll simply say goodbye, everybody.